Thank you, Father Jim. And before I begin, uh, I just want to say that this has to get turned on. Uh, how th this is really a dream for me to be together in this context where we are discussing missions and evangelism on a national level. And it's not a room with three or four people. We have an entire room full of people, and it's not the first time we've come together. And there's a committee working on it, and it's being hosted by a department of the archdiocese with so much talent in this room. It is really, really exciting to be a part of this. Listening to the presentations, the different perspectives, the different angles that we're coming at this, I mean, it's really, really exciting. And I believe that the direction is one of a lot of hope and a lot more to come. I also just want to mention that, uh, you know, I see people that have stay been- Stay close to the microphone. Stay close, sir people here that have been with us uh, in the mission field, a number of you. And then also, we do have one of our missionaries here, right? one of your missionaries here right now, Jennifer Rice, if you could just stand up in the back. That's Jennifer Rice. If you want to hear about what's happening in Guatemala, that's the person to see. She's engaged in the home for a little bit uh, during her uh, furlough. And also the sister of one of our missionaries is here. Nikki, are you, are you around? Not in the room right now at the bookstore buying good books, uh, probably. So let me begin. Got it. So I'm going to begin with, uh, there she is, the uh, sister of one of our missionaries standing up there, Nikki, right? Yes. <laughs> I just introduced you as uh, the sister of Elizabeth Manuel, who are also with Thomas, who are also father uh, to be ordained soon, Deacon Thomas, who are in Guatemala also. I'd like to begin with an analogy. When my son was, when my son was married, one of the wedding gifts that he received was a beer brewing kit and we brewed together. It was a lot of fun and one way that I was able to connect with him. And I learned a lot about brewing and a lot about yeast. In fact, I found that brewing beer has things in common with making prosfera, which might be a more appropriate way to approach this in this conference, but excuse me, I'm gonna stick to beer. So I'd like to share a little bit of what I have learned in this analogy towards the theme of my talk. Both making beer, doing prosfera, there's a lot of work that you need to do ahead of time so that things are right, so the yeast will live and multiply. To do that, you need the right ingredients. They have to be mixed well. And you need to keep the temperatures conducive for yeast to grow. And at the same time, you need to get the yeast and not only to get the yeast, you need the right yeast for what you are making. Now, in brewing, different yeasts are used for different bases, or wort, as it's called. And depending on what style of beer you're making and what wort you will put the yeast in, it will tell you what yeast to use. One yeast will live, another yeast will die. Each yeast has a different temperature range that it operates under. They all produce different flavors. There's no good yeast or bad yeast. They produce different effects and survive in different conditions. Much of what's being covered in this year's conference is compared to getting the conditions right for adding the yeast to make sure we have a healthy and solid foundation so that when the yeast comes in, it will live and it will thrive. In my presentation, though, I'll be expanding on the necessary healthy foundation that we need to have and focus on getting and adding the right yeast to that healthy foundation so that it will thrive and multiply. I'm going to do that with lessons learned from the mission field. Now, you might say, well, what does orthodoxy have to do with the mission field in foreign lands? everything. While our contexts and our cultures are different, the principles are universal. One of the contextual dimensions of mission 
in many cultures is communication through stories. So much of what Jesus taught, as Father Aris told us, as we heard from others in their teaching, was done that way. So in that spirit, I'd like to dig in. I'll start with Solale. Now, Solale in mythological terms is called a shaman. In street language, he is referred to as a witch doctor. In his village, he is viewed as someone with a connection to gods and the spirits. He can be approached for prophecy, for healing, for intervention, and for counsel. Some shamans do that and more. They can be asked to intervene for revenge, to bring calamity upon others. We might call them the hitman of the village. But our shaman Salali, he doesn't do that. He's a good shaman. When I first learned we were visiting Salali, I didn't know which one he was. I was just told when I asked our priest, bring me someplace where the gospel hasn't been preached, that he had arranged a meeting for myself and Salali. This brings us to lesson one, the first lesson I'd like to cover. Why did the priest arrange for that meeting? Why didn't we just start with the people who knew, he knew, or the children that were in that village where he could have started a Sunday school very easily? Because innovation, which includes turning to a new religion, is often spread through respected leaders. Those persons can be respected community leaders, like school teachers, successful businessmen, or a shaman, like Salale. They can be family leaders, people in family groups that other members of the family look up to and listen to. Fortunately, our local priest knew this, and rather than taking us to a group of children or to a person lower on the scale of influence in the village, he took us to the top most respected leader. He said, if you can convince Salale, the whole village will follow. But if Salale is against you, it will be very difficult to gain villagers and followers in that village. Now, the way to respected opinion leaders may not always be direct as it was in this case. Sometimes it can be through their children. Nevertheless, in spreading the gospel amongst larger networks of people, we need to recognize that certain individuals have influence in larger networks. And then we need to identify and work with these individuals, however we may get to them. Now let me bring that down to a practical level. When we try to spread the faith in our local communities, what can we do? Well, we can see what larger networks are the people in our parish connected to and then use those people to reach out to those social groups. And more importantly, when we're breaking ground in new territory and planting new churches or missions, this is where this principle is really critical. We need to keep our eyes out for those people who are keys in their communities, be that entire villages, like with Salale, or smaller family networks. And when we find that respected leader, we are positioning ourselves through that person to reach many more people. On the other hand, if our contacts are not people of influence, the challenge is greater. Still possible, but with a greater challenge. The, the next lesson. There is a time and a season for presenting the gospel. So back to our stories. I'm in a small town the only one for miles and miles around, surrounded by a barren, semi-arid, semi dry desert. And I hear of a missionary who's been out there for 20 years preaching the gospel. And so I go to meet with him. And he learns that I have a meeting set up with Salale. And he says to me, that old witch doctor, We've tried to reach with him time and time again. There's no way he's going to listen to you. Well, I'm jumping ahead to the end of the story, but it's important to know this lesson from the beginning. Salale, in the end, accepted the gospel, and the entire village followed him. And I'm certain 
This was not because I was any better at communicating or presenting the gospel than this veteran missionary that I met. Rather, it was the right time, and I was the right person at that time. Had I gone five years earlier, I don't think Salale would have listened to me. There is a time and a season for presenting the gospel, a time when people are receptive. Just as this applies to individuals, it can apply to families, communities, villages, and even entire countries. How does that apply to local evangelism? Well, let me share another story from my journey to Christ. While I was brought up in the Orthodox Church, there was a time when I rejected Christianity. During that phase of my life, when people approached me, I was not receptive. In fact, for me, it was a chance to hone my skills in philosophy and debate and logic, and I feel remorse about some of those bright-eyed campus evangelists that I sent scurrying away. But another time came in my life when I had worked through certain issues. I was now open, listening, seeking. I wanted to know. I was a different person as far as my readiness to hear the gospel. Same person, but a different time and period in my life. In missiology, this is called receptivity. People become more receptive and ready to hear the gospel at certain times and phases in their lives. And just as it applies to individuals, like I said, it can apply to people in entire countries, as was in the case of Albania the first five years following the collapse of communism. In that country, religion was completely forbidden any expression of the faith for decades. And when communism collapsed, there was a thirst and a hunger amongst the general population to learn what was it they were forbidding us to do. The country was ready to hear. People would listen if you just approached them and said, I want to talk about this. Receptivity can arise from a range of conditions. It can come through personal struggles, by reaching levels of thought or stages in life, as in my case, or even political events like in Albania or maybe one day South Korea. And as we strive to present the gospel to others, we need to be conscious of this. We may not know before we approach someone if they are receptive but we can be attentive to it, both when it is there and when it is not, just as important. And if we are attentive, then we can recognize it and be ready to share our faith when it is there. There is a time and a season for presenting the gospel when people and places are receptive. Lesson number three, know the other. Again, let's go back to Salali. <clears throat> the day has come to visit him. We journey through the bush across the scorching desert, and we approach the shaman, the shaman's hut. But we don't just directly approach it. We circle around it and come to it from the other side, from the east. Salali's not there. So we send out messengers to find him, and we sit on the dirt inside this compound surrounded by the bush, waiting. Eventually, he finally arrives. And after greetings and breaking the ice, it's time to present our message and why we have come. I begin by affirming we're not here on our own authority. We have been sent by the creator of heaven and earth. Now, the Turkana, they believe in a creator of heaven and earth, or a creator, let me say. And then I start the religious history of life as it is understood by the Turkana ancient traditions. It is a story which is similar to that of Adam and Eve. Different names, a different scenario, but the same outcome. 
the original people become estranged from God, and after that, suffering and death enters into the world. I move on then to acknowledge how God is often respected and appealed to through sacrifices, because the, the Turkana do that. Through the shaman, they offer sacrifices to appease and to appeal to God. And then I point out that, you know, where are these sacrifices gotten you? How's it going? You're still suffering. It's harsh out here. It's not working. You're in the midst of a 10-year drought. Next, I move on to make bridges. First, between their practice of animal sacrifice and Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself once and for all for the salvation of the world. And from that, to the kingdom of heaven, which they did not have the kingdom, a concept for the kingdom of heaven in the Turkana culture. When I come back to make another bridge, I make it with their traditions, explaining that just as in their tradition, all good people come from the East, our scriptures tell us that when Jesus Christ comes again, we will see him coming from the East. And finally, after acknowledging all of this and relating to their understanding of life and making bridges to our faith, then I conclude with asking, can we come back and present this message further. The shaman responds, yes, I can feel that you are good and what you are bringing is good. So, to the lessons. In this case, what is it that helped to create the bond and spirit of communication and understanding in order to speak to Salale? We first learned about his beliefs and about his culture. We knew to approach his home respectfully from the east. And this was all done with the belief that God has been speaking to Salali and the Turkana people long before we ever arrived to preach the gospel for the first time. We had not come to erase or invalidate that communication, but to announce a fulfillment and deeper understanding of things not yet revealed. But to do that, First, we had to know what they already know. Unfortunately, some approaches towards evangelizing non-Christians begins with the presumption that all forms of religious belief are 100% invalid, and the only truth is in the gospel, as we present it and when we present it. Some go further to say that all ancestors who came before we happened to walk on the scene and preach the gospel have died and gone to hell. I remember meeting one pastor who was in personal crisis because that's what his faith taught. And he just couldn't accept that his ancestors all went to hell before the white missionaries came to preach Christianity. As Orthodox, we acknowledge God's presence and activity throughout human history. While we confirm the truth of the gospel, we also recognize glimmers of truth wherever they are found, because our method of reaching out to others is first to learn about them, to understand how and what God has revealed. And this is our third lesson. To understand how has God spoken to and how is he understood by the person you're reaching out to. This is what enabled us to communicate with Salali, and at the same time, it's an essential practice for communicating the gospel, whether it's around the world or here at home. We need to respect others and their integrity and the way they have struggled in their life to understand their place and God. We have to learn what do they know how do they see the world in order to then present a bridge from where they are over the chasm to a deeper knowledge and communion with Christ? I remember once dialoguing with a person who claimed to be a staunch atheist. At the same time, he was a person of love and generosity, somebody who really cared for others. And since God is love, Somehow, this man, he knew God, even though intellectually he couldn't accept it. 
So I could have written him off when he declared his atheism, but rather my stance was to listen, to explore, to ask, how has God been speaking to him? What prevents him from acknowledging the connection between the love in his heart and Jesus Christ? Through that approach, we then have a chance to communicate at a deeper level with others, rather than in that arrogant stance that will turn people away who don't see things the right way, our way. With this approach, we can look into the heart of who we are speaking with, whether it's remote tribal people, a college student, a parent, a brother, a friend, a colleague, then we can build the right kind of bridge and one that starts from the right place, as was done with the atheist man or with the shaman in the desert. The next lesson, reaching out through friends and family. This is a really big one that we have found in the mission field. There was a wide river flowing gently between the mountains in the south of Albania. We'd arrived just before sunset in our four by four Jeep to go down to the river and to look for a place where the river bank was wide enough for a couple hundred people and where the water was waist deep but not flowing too fast that it would take somebody away. Local people from the village heard our jeep come, and they followed us down to the river, curiously watching what we were doing. The next morning, those same people were to come down to that river again, but this time to be baptized. And what's more, those people were all from a Muslim village. How did that happen? Well, living in Albania, teaching at the seminary, where Father Luke also taught with me, one of the goals that we had was empowering groups that would be able to evangelize throughout the country. This happened in all kinds of situations, but the result would be the same, mass baptisms. In order to reach these villages, especially ones that did not already have a Christian background, there were principles that I taught and that I learned when I was studying at mission school and from my experience as a missionary in Africa. And one of those principles is a key and was a key to reaching the Muslim village. And that is, the gospel most often spreads through friends, family, and colleagues. Let's look at how that happened in this case. The seminary student came from an area along the river that was lined with small villages. When he was younger, like most Albanians, he was drafted into the army and during that time, he made a friend, and the friendship lasted. To make the story short, freedom of religion comes. The seminarian converts and goes to seminary. He brings his friend to faith. And now while taking the class, he starts to brainstorm with me, how can he reach those villages around him where his, and his friend becomes the key? The two of them get permission to start teaching the children that were known to his friend. And then the children share with the parents, and then the parents start asking questions, and then they start reaching out to the parents, and in the end, almost the entire village was baptized on that day. Let's come back home. How does that apply to our situation here in the USA? Well, it can guide us. One of the most effective ways we can use to spread our faith and to grow our communities. Now, in the notes, and I'll also put it up here, I've given you a survey that you can fill out. Uh, the survey was asking people, how did they first come to church and to Christ? It's an old survey, but the dynamics it measures haven't changed as far as I'm aware. So I'll put it up here. Take a moment, think about this. Uh, if you have a pen, you might want to fill it out. Uh, how did you first come to Christ and the church that you are at now? Now let's see how that compares to the survey results. Just take a moment, think about, was it any of these things that are up here or something different that brought you to Christ 
and brought you to the Orthodox Church or the church that you're in. Are you ready for the results? According to that study, <clears throat> just walked in, three to four percent. Had a special need, two to three. The priest, only three to five. Sorry, guys. <laughs> the visitation program, one to two. The Sunday school program, four to five. A crusade, point one. Special programs, three to four percent through friends or relatives, 75 to 90% of the people that joined the church that were surveyed came through friends and family. I'm that way as well. It, it holds true in my life, and it held true in so many places that we have worked. When we learn, what we learn from this is contrary to what we might have thought. There's a target group of people that we are already positioned for to reach out to with the Lord. And we don't have to create a special program or a crusade or a door-to-door -door campaign to find them. While there are many important things that we can and must do to make our witnesses more effective and our parish a welcoming place to bring them, like we are talking about in this conference, the people that we are best positioned to reach are our friends, our family, and our colleagues, people we have relationship with, people who we like to be with, people who know us, and more important, people who trust us. Statistics show the average Christian has four to eight non-Christian, non-church, non-practicing people among their friends, family, and colleagues. And a new Christian has even more. Now, I don't want to oversimplify. There are a host of things we need to do to make our witness more effective. One of them is being addressed by so many of the speakers in this conference, making our parish healthy and inviting. But still, if we want to get people to our healthy churches, this principle is essential. And one of the best ways to spread the faith, evangelize others, is to think about the phenomena to train and inspire people in our parishes or missions to reach out to their existing networks. And then when those people come in, have them do the same thing. Do the math. It's amazing how quick the church can grow using what God has already given to us in our hands. Lesson five, and I think that's the last one. Funny thing happened to me when I was working with my translator in Albania, speaking to groups of people in the mission field. In fact, it didn't happen once, it happened lots of times. I would tell my translator, you know, I'm telling the people, but through my translator, we have a saying in America. And my translator would turn to me and say, you know what, we also have that saying in Albania. <laughs> and what he was really saying was, you know what, Albania was around before America was. It's our saying. <laughs> One of those sayings, birds of a feather flock together. Now, how does that apply to missions and evangelism? Let me explain. In technical terms, our missiologists, to try to make this more lofty and sophisticated, they've coined it the homogeneous unit principle. Sounds pretty like official. The principle states that most people in a parish usually have some common thread between them, and the gospel is most effectively spread when trying to reach and bring people that have similarities between themselves and the people in our parish. What kinds of things are these? Most common in our orthodox context is ethnic background. So many of our churches and missions were strategically and successfully planted this way. But it can go far beyond that. Who do people intermarry with? Sometimes it's social class or economic class. 
Other times, it's an intellectual stance. But the theory assumes that when you analyze a group of people in a congregation, you will find similarities and common characteristics between them. So what is the implication? Is that when doing evangelism, we can be most effective in finding what that is and then strategically reaching out to those types of people. As an example, I'm dialoguing with the bishop in Ghana. So, oh, Father Martin, we've just crossed the border into the neighboring country and started a mission. So I start trying to apply the missiological thinking to see who is the group so we know who are we most likely to be able to reach out to. And pretty soon it becomes evident that the group of people they planted the church with was a group of Ghanaians that were living across the border in the neighboring country. And so I was able to say, Bishop, you know, this is your strength right now with that congregation. You're going to be able to reach out to these people wonderfully. But if you want to reach outside that group to these people with a different language, who don't intermarry with that group, who have different tribal conditions, well, you're going to have to do something else to break that barrier. Birds of a feather flock together. If you think of the previous lesson, you also see how this principle fits together with that. Usually, we have a lot in common with our friends and our family, right? Something draws us together. If the gospel most often spreads through friends and family, doesn't it make sense that the people that we're bringing to church are people kind of like us, that we have commonalities with? Here's another tidbit that supports that. A survey was done on two groups of people six months after they joined a church. One group was people who left, and the other group was people who stayed. What they found was that most people who stayed claimed they developed numerous friendships in the six months, and the people who left had developed few or none. If we're too different from the people around us, it's hard for natural friendships to develop, and that is something necessary in the body of Christ. Now, some might look at this principle and say, that goes against the scripture, where we are told we're all equal, men, women, Jew, Greek, slave, free, rich, poor. The epistle of James tells us we are not to be exclusive in the congregation, and yet it's true. One strong point in thinking about this is that we are not the ones being exclusive or selective. It's the people who are reaching out to who decide to stay or to leave. And while we must grow in Christ to the point where we want to make friends outside our comfort zone because of our love for Christ, people who are not yet established in Christ that we're reaching out to are not at that point level. Now there are exceptions, and as I speak around and I hear different people, I know there's exceptions, but they're exceptions. As I travel around the country and around the world to various parishes and look at people from the sociological perspective, usually I can identify and detect things of commonality that the group in the different parishes have, and they can be different. I remember just one, one priest, he said, you know, Father Martin, everybody in my parish is sick. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's what they all have in common, and you're good at reaching out to that kind of people. <laughs> he said, oh. As much as we might want to change the phenomena, if we're striving to plant or grow churches and bring people to Christ, we will be most effective if we understand what do our parishioners have in common, and through them, strive to reach out to similar groups of people. The last comment, one of encouragement. God is there, or God is here, maybe, if I were to rewrite that, or God is everywhere. I'll come back for my last time to the story of Salale. A year after meeting, we go back to his village, now to baptize any that had been catechized and were willing to be baptized after that first year. Salale was the first, 
and a hundred over a hundred people followed him on that day. But on that day I learned how small a role we played in that baptism that happened and how God had been doing unseen things that I never thought were going on. Let me give you a couple points. When we first went to visit him, we were to cross a dry sandy riverbed that had been dry for a multi-year season during a time of drought. We almost didn't get to the village because overnight the river filled up with water and we couldn't get our 4 by 4 cars across it. So we had to wade across the river and hike through the desert to get to the village. When we got to the village, Salale wasn't there. He knew that the river had filled and said, these white men are never going to get across that river. They're not going to come. And he had left. People were sent to find him, and later he shows up. The next year, when we went for the baptisms, the river was still dry when we arrived. We were prepared to dig a hole, line it with practice, plastic, and bring water from the well in order to fill the hole and baptize the people. But overnight, the river filled, and we baptized everyone in the river. After the baptisms, I sat with Salale and a translator, and he told me his story. And I learned what God had been up to. First, Salali said, when you came the first time, I was away from the village. Even though you sent people to find me, I didn't need them because I received the message from God that you were there and I was already on my way. Then he went on. Many years ago, when he was still alive, my father, he told me, one day a white man is going to come and he's going to bring you a message from God, and you have to listen to that message. He went on, I've seen that man in my dreams, and you are him. He also told me, the rivers, when they filled with water, said both the first time and the second time, confirms that this is from God. You see, because for us, the coming of water is a sign of the blessings of God. Those rivers filling were God's sign to those people. Now, while I had planned and recruited and fundraised and strategized how to reach this village, as I traveled across the world, as I learned the culture and how to contextualize the message and put my heart and soul into evangelizing these people, and I thought I was leading this team to Turkana to evangelize them, but all these efforts were just a drop compared to what God was doing with them and with me. I was nervous. I was unsure. But all along, God was there. He was there working with these people and with myself as well, so that one day we would meet and his will would be fulfilled. And I bring this up because evangelizing and sharing our faith with others can be frightening. But we must remember, this is not our plan. We did not take on human form to save the human race. This is God's plan. He has entrusted it to us. And he is in us. He is behind us. He is ahead of us. He is preceding us. And he is granting us his grace so that through us, his name may be preached and glorified among all peoples of the earth. Thank you.